<clears throat> so, yeah, so I, I talked about this um, distribution, student teacher distribution, and I want, again, I want you guys to see that it varies depending on uh, the sample size. So, there are some properties of the student teacher distribution, and if you want, I'll put those. I'll put those in the in the notes, but <clears throat> you can see the center is still also the mean equal to zero, but the standard deviation varies for the t distribution, and um, the width and height of it varies depending on sample size. So when we talk about the student t distribution, we talk about if I were to draw it, which I will, you know, it's still a standard norm, it's still a normal distribution curve. This is not a beautiful. But then I'm going to label it T distribution. So if you see, you know, if you guys are used to me, whenever I draw a normal distribution curve, I'm always defining it. I'm always writing SND. If it's standard normal distribution, I'm writing ND. If it's just another type of normally distributed type of situation, you know, um, I, I label it depending on whatever distribution I'm on because it could vary, even though it's still, even though it's still, you know, symmetric and bell shaped. So when I when I write the student t distribution, then that means I have what we call t scores along the horizontal scale instead of z scores. Center is still zero, but the you know the, um, the mean is zero, but the standard deviation for the population varies. So we're on this distribution when the population standard deviation is unknown. So you guys are going to use t scores. For critical values for t interval for your confidence interval when doing a confidence interval for a mean and sigma the standard deviation for the population is unknown okay um when you're on the student t distribution because it does vary depending on sample size there's something called degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom that now we have to talk about. And the way that you find those is simply n minus one. So now that you're talking about a student z distribution, you're still talking about a bell shaped curve. You're still talking about a symmetric bell shaped curve. We're going to get more into this when we get into hypothesis testing. You have no questions regarding critical values on. The student t distribution, and you should. I want to show you how to find one. Maybe I'll show you when we do a question, like one of these questions, um, just to show you because you will need to know how to find them when you do hypothesis testing, which is like a couple weeks out. So you need to know your degrees of freedom, which is n minus one, and then you know it's again a calculated trick. So it's in a similar location as inverse norm. It's just inverse t. So we'll come back to that. So you can still find area under this curve if you need to, which you don't do as much. <laughs> but, you know, and then you can still find values along the horizontal scale corresponding to area, which are, you know, right now we're going to call them critical T-scores. Okay, that's what, how you're going to hear them. So for now, I'll find them for your confidence interval. You need to know when you're doing critical T versus critical Z, <clears throat> when you're doing Z interval versus T interval because it is important so i kind of like just did that here it is important depending on your situation so all right let's see i'm going to do a problem in the homework and this problem is okay i don't know which number it is i think i have question seven this one's question three on homework two so <clears throat> how do i know which distribution to use. And I want to show you, even though it doesn't ask for it, I want to show you how to find a critical T-score using this one. And then it's going to ask me which distribution to use. And then this is another interpretation of the confidence interval that um, this is your, these are your points. They're just drop down menus, I think. No, you input the values, but this is not a hard interpretation. So 
you have a couple things that we're going to do today. Introducing the T, introducing a new interpretation for your confidence intervals, or another way to like represent interpreting, which is this one. And then um, I want to talk about how to find critical T scores on a student T distribution because you're going to need those later if you're even if you're not asked for it on the homework assignment this week. So I'll probably go beyond what this question asked too and find the margin of error just for practice. Okay, this is all just extra stuff for practice. So let's see what we have here. So you are interested in finding a 90% uh, 90 confidence interval. So I'm looking for a 90% confidence interval. And I'm going to stress a couple things because next week you have your test and you're going to have to determine like, which confidence interval you're finding. And so you are finding a confidence interval for a mean, mean, which means that you're doing a confidence interval for a mean. So now once you determine that's the type of confidence interval you're doing, now you have to figure out whether sigma is known or sigma is unknown because you have to figure out whether you're using Z or T. So this is my thought process. What kind of confidence interval do I need? And then if it's a confidence interval for a mean, which situation do I have? You're not doing proportions yet, but this is just for next week when it's all mixed up. So you're interested in finding a 90% confidence interval for the mean number of visits for physical therapy patients. The data below shows the number of visits for 10 randomly selected physical therapy patients. So my sample size is 10. Round answers to three decimal places where possible. So we always want to know how to round. So I'm not given much here, right? I'm not given any statistical values, really. I'm not given like the sample mean, standard deviation. I'm not given that stuff. I'm given the confidence level, which I need because that, that, you know, I have to determine what kind of confidence interval they want. I'm given the sample size, even if I wasn't told that this was 10 randomly selected physical therapy patients, I could technically count them. So I want to find a 90% confidence interval for the average mean number of visits for physical therapy patients. Basically, I'm determining, you know, average number of physical, uh, visit, average number of visit, visit for the population of physical therapy patients. Um, so this is a sample, it's a small sample. I would probably try to sample anyway. To compute the confidence interval, we use a blank. So this is like a drop down menu. So you're gonna you know, start to be asked whether you're using Z or T distribution, right? So to determine that, first of all, I have to indicate, yeah, I'm finding a confidence interval for a mean. You're never gonna be asked whether you're using Z or T if you're doing a confidence interval for a proportion. It's only when you're doing a confidence interval for a mean. Now, given that I don't hear anything like yesterday, right? Um, yesterday we heard like, assume the population standard deviation is 11.3 ounces. We did that yesterday. Or like even for this list of data, they gave me a list of data. They didn't give me, you know, um, they didn't give me sample mean. They didn't give me anything. But they did tell me, assuming the population standard deviation was this. So it's a little bit different today because they don't give me that. I don't see anything regarding the population standard deviation, which means that sigma is unknown. So all I have is this list of values. I have no information about the population. Sigma's unknown, I don't know the population standard deviation. So now I'm using a T distribution. So um, you're gonna be asked that now, probably almost every question, which distribution are you using? Because it's very important, you're not gonna get away from that for the rest of the semester. You have to be able to decide which distribution you're on. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm gonna add to this question with 90% confidence, the population mean number of visits per physical therapy patient is between um, blank and blank visits. So this one is basically asking you for the confidence interval. So this one is like a input question. I don't know why it's not letting me. My computer's deleted, that's why. 
Alright. So I want you to recognize that they're not directly asking you for 90% confidence interval, but they're asking you or they're telling you fill in the gaps here. With 90% confidence, find or the population mean number of visits per physical therapy patient is between. So you're basically, this is the interpretation of a confidence interval. You're basically just saying the numbers here. They're interpreting it for you. So you're basically trying to find a 90% confidence interval for the mean number of visits per physical therapy patient. So um, given that I have a list of data values, that means that I have to input that into my calculator, right? So if we remember how to do that, we have to go to stat and then edit, right? Stat and then edit. Actually, I, could probably, I might not write all these. Stat and then edit. So uh, once again, I think I said this yesterday. If you guys have something in the list that you want to input these into, so like I want to put them in L1 and I have stuff in L1, let me get rid of that stuff. I'm going to scroll up so that L1 is highlighted. And then if you're doing the physical calculator, and I suggest regardless of what app you're using, try this first, because if you don't try clear enter first and you go and press delete, you might delete your actual L1 list rather than just getting rid of the values in it. So if you're doing the physical calculator, it's clear enter, clear it out. But if I do that on the app here and I scroll up to L1 and I do clear enter, you'll see nothing happens, which means for the app, I press delete to clear the list. But if I press delete on the graphing calculator, it's going to clear things that I don't want it to clear. So clear enter first, okay? Um, all right, so we have to input these values, and I hope you guys are doing it with me, and you can slow me down if you need to. Okay, I know people quiet today, making sure everybody's good. So do it with me. So we're going to input these values. So 15, 18, 13, 5, 13, 15, 17. 16, 10, and 18. And then I like to check. It says that I'm on like the 11 data value, which is blank. So I have 10 above it and I should have 10, right? I have 10 here. So I input my numbers. So do that if you haven't already. <clears throat> so I like to go back to my home screen, second mode, basically to quit and just get have a blank screen because sometimes things overlap and it can get confusing. And I want to go now, I want to do a confidence interval. I'm going to go to stat and over to test. Now, again, again, once again, everything up here initially ends in test. And I do not want the stuff that ends in test, even though it looks the same. I don't want the stuff that ends in test. That goes with hypothesis testing, which will be coming. You guys will do that, but you're not doing it now. So go down beyond that, past that. Anything that ends in interval deals with an interval. And I want an interval because I want a confidence interval. So which one do I want? Um, I have three options, you guys, for your class, for this class. You only have three options. Is it one proxient? Is it the interval or T interval? And so we determined that <clears throat> we were doing a confidence interval for a mean because basically that's what they say. You were interested in finding a confidence interval for a mean. Once you determine that, then you just have to figure out a sigma known or sigma unknown. And in this case, they didn't tell me anything about a population standard deviation, so sigma is unknown, which means that I'm going T interval. Now I'm going to show you how to find the confidence interval first, and I also want to show you how to find a critical t-score, um, like as if you were using the formula, because you're going to need to know that later. So we're doing t-interval for my confidence interval, which for me, what number was that? T-interval was number eight. 
And then I have to figure out, do I want data or do I want stats? You guys tell me. <clears throat> do you want data or do you want stats? Which one? Data. Yes, data. Because if I had stats, right, then that means I'm giving statistical values, which I don't know, sample mean. I mean, technically, you could find the sample mean and sample standard deviation, but I think T interval is going to give me that and make my life easier. So data, because I have a list of values, and ironically, it asks me for a list. L1, um, that's where mine is. So if yours is not there, second and whatever number corresponds to your list. For me, second one for L1. Frequency, leave it as one. You can always leave it as one because you guys are just doing a list of values like that. My C level is 90%, so 0.9 here. And then we're going to calculate. Boom. This is, and again, let me screenshot. Okay. This is my output, right? The interval this is the output that I get. Okay, so make sure you guys get that. And again, this output is inter interval notation, right? I'll put it over here. So you see how it gives me, this is my interval and interval notation. It also gives me the sample mean and the sample standard deviation if I need that. So I didn't have to find that initially. It gives me that. That's why I you know, skip steps and stuff. So my 90% my 90% confidence interval, I'm going to write it in three different ways, right? Three different ways to represent it. They don't ask me for the three here, but I'm writing it just for you guys. So 11.6, and we're rounding to three decimal places, 11.665, um, 16.335 interval notation. If I'm in this notation, it is approximating a population mean, and the lower end is um, 11.65 and the 16.335. And the last way to represent it is in terms of in terms of the point estimate and the margin of error. Which in this case, I don't have the margin of error yet, but I can find it because I have my confidence interval. So. X bar that gave me here to be 14. This is my point estimate. This is the sample statistic I'm using to approximate the population parameter. So that's called a point estimate. My margin of error can be found two different ways. Where's my phone here? Remember I wrote this down yesterday? Um, this is the formula for the situation when sigma is known, right? We're doing a situation where sigma is unknown now, if you want to use the um, and the, the formula. And the margin of error can be found by taking the t critical value multiplied by s, the sample standard deviation, divided by the square root, and this is the multiplication, okay? So the, the formula is not extremely different. Notice that if sigma is known, it's at, you know, I put sigma in the formula, which is a population standard deviation. If sigma is unknown, I have S for sample standard deviation and T-scores. So I'm going to show you probably how to find, I might just use this, do this with the formula and do it with the calculator trick just to show you um, same thing, but also I need to know how to find a critical T-score for later. So I want you guys to know that. So I'll start by just doing it with our you know, little trick from last time where if I know the confidence interval, I can find the margin of error by taking the upper level of the confidence interval and subtracting the lower level and divide by two. So, parentheses, 16.335 minus 11.665 and then divide by two. And I hope you guys are doing it with me, 2.335, right? So my last representation of the confidence interval in terms of X bar and E is 14 plus or minus 2.335. And this is how I could get to these values, right? I would take, um, if you're doing the formula, you take the sample mean, point estimate, subtract the margin of error, and add the margin of error to get the two ends, right? Margin of error, how far away I am from the actual value. So. Again, I'm adding to this question, but technically I'm done with this question. 16 point, whoops. Let's 
so that I cannot do that. So 11.665 my lower end and then 16.335 as my answers for that. You know, it doesn't ask me for all these, but I want to show you all the different representations. Um, and before I do this one, which is not hard, I want to talk about finding the critical T value. And yesterday, do they have, I can't remember if they have, remember yesterday we did this, where it asks for, and this was uh, homework one, it asks for like alpha over two, z alpha over two. That problem asked you to walk through all of the steps basically to use the formula. That's what you would go through every time you're using the formula. You have to find your alpha. You have to find alpha over two because you have a confidence interval which has two ends, right? Because you have a lower end and an upper end. And then um, you find the critical value corresponding to that. Then you find your margin of error. Then you add and subtract it to the mean. You have to go through that every time if you're doing the formula. So this question that we did yesterday walked us through kind of the steps of that. You don't have to do that if you're asked for an interval because you guys have the calculator trick, but you still should know how to find a critical value because you're going to need that later. So I'm going to show you how to find that here because we're on a new distribution, the T distribution. You've never done it before on a T distribution. You've done it on a Z distribution, like a standard normal distribution, and then like a basic normal distribution curve. We're on a T distribution curve, which is still symmetric and bell shaped, but now I'm labeling it, labeling it T distribution. The center of it happens to be zero, but I also have to consider now degrees of freedom because I'm on a T distribution. So you're going to be asked for DF. DF, degrees of freedom, are always found by n minus 1. And is my sample size which in this case is 10, so I'm subtracting one from that. So my degrees of freedom are 9 for this particular example. You're going to see that I need that when I go to my calculator trip to find the critical T-score. Now, remember I talked about alpha? Let me make this a different color just because. Remember I talked about alpha yesterday? This is a new, maybe a new variable you haven't seen yet. Alpha is the complement of the confidence level. I find that by doing 1 minus the confidence level. In this particular case, alpha is 0.1, 1 minus 0.9. And then alpha over 2, you take that value and you divide it by 2. Okay, again, I'm doing extra stuff for this problem. I'm not simply doing the problem. I'm giving you more because you should practice this stuff per problem. You know, sometimes it's not enough just to do what's given. You might have to go a little bit more. I'm doing something like this, where I have each of the steps, all these little pieces that I, you know, I would need if I were using the formula. And again, I'm going to stress it. You're going to need to know how to find critical values later. Okay? And you might not have to divide alpha in half, but the idea is to know how to find critical values on either S and D curve or a T distribution curve. So we split alpha into two pieces because technically we have a confidence interval, which has two different areas, lower end and upper end. And I saw a visual of this, I think, uh, like Professor Tammy in her topic session, she did a nice visual um, she, in her notes, she did a nice visual of the different confidence, the most typical confidence levels and how the areas, you, see, you know, she shows the, the center, like if this is a 90% confidence, right, level, this is 90%, so 10% is here and here which is why we cut it in half. Okay, so she had a nice visual with all the critical values on it. But not for, I think just for Z. But this is my value here that I want to find. The positive version of the critical value here. And this is the notation that represents that. T subscript alpha over 2. This is a T score that has this area to the right of it. Now, yesterday when we did this, right, we found the Z critical Z score with that area to the right, inverse norm. Not extremely different with a critical T, it's just instead of inverse norm, we're doing inverse T. So here, you find that in the same location as you find inverse norm, which is second bars. Inverse T, number four, right under inverse norm. And if I go there, 
And actually, I'm going to go on both of these. So second bars for this at two. Inverse T is number four here. Great. Mm, my stuff. You guys are going to have to. I thought I had. I thought I paid for it. I guess I didn't. Sorry. Go to inverse T. <laughs> and then you see how it says area and DF. So it tells you the order in which you have to input area, comma, df, degrees of freedom. You have to tell the degrees of freedom. So my area is always the area to the left, which because we're doing the positive version of this, you see we have 0 0.05 to the right. This is where we do that one minus 0 0.05. And then my degrees of freedom, we determine we're nine because it's always n minus one. So you guys that are doing it on the other calculator, you have to know the order in which to do it, which looks like this, inverse T, one minus because I'm, I know the area to the right, and then we always input area to the left here, so that's why it's the complement, and then comma, degrees of freedom. So for your notes, one minus point three. I don't know if you heard that bang, that is the dog doing stuff he's not supposed to do. All right. And my critical T score is 1.833. I'll probably do this also in the next problem to practice it. Now, I'm going to show you because I'm just trying to show you things how to find the margin of error with the formula. I hear somebody. Go ahead, I hear you. Somebody. I'm not sure if I need it. Where's my picture? There you guys. Who we'll show up? If you guys have a question, go ahead. I'm listening. If I'm doing it with the formula, right? T of alpha over two times s over the square root of n. And I know you guys don't necessarily care about the formula, but I'm just proving that it's the same. I won't use the formula again. S 4.02768 divided by the square root of n. Square root of 10. And I figure, well, I might as well do that just because I found the critical t-score anyway. So I'm just, this is what you would have to do if you're going to use the formula to find your margin of error. And again, some people might not want to do it that way. I don't know. You gotta float your boat. 2.33, so I get the same thing, right? 2.335, grounded. Now, the question again did not ask me for the margin of error. I am just simply practicing finding the margin of error because you would need to know how to find that at any given time. Because you could be asked for it directly. Some of the questions ask for it directly. Some of the questions ask for it within the you know, as part of your step. So um, I'm just practicing it. And you have three representations of confidence intervals. So this last one needs the margin of error to represent it in its form. And then I practice finding the critical t-score because that is a possible question too. If not now, later. So I am adding stuff to this. I know there's a lot of pieces, but you, you should know all the pieces. And, but once you practice the pieces, it's very repetitive, okay? It's a repetitive, repetitive thing. It sometimes gets so repetitive, it's like frustrating. <laughs> but I am suggesting to you guys, because you don't have enough practice in the assignments, I'm suggesting to you, even if the question does not ask for the margin of error, even if it doesn't ask for the critical value, I'm telling you to practice that because um, you're going to need to know these pieces. It's very important to know all the pieces. It's very important to know how to find all the pieces because you could be asked for anyone at any point. Um, this last part, this is just another way to talk about like interpretation of the confidence level and confidence interval. 
So this is just, um, I mean, they wrote it out for you. You don't have to come up with it yourself. It's just a matter of inputting something here and something here. So if many groups of 10 randomly selected physical therapy patients are studied, if many groups of the same sample size um, are studied, then a different confidence interval would be produced from each group, obviously, because it's coming from different samples. So about blank percent of these confidence intervals will contain the true population mean number of visits per patient, and about blank percent will not contain the true population mean number of visits per patient. So basically we're saying if we continue to do these groups of 10 randomly selected physical therapy patients, and we do confidence intervals for each one of them, obviously they're gonna be different because they're coming from different samples. And we're using samples to basically approximate something for a population. Because it's a 90% confidence interval, about 90% of them will contain the true population mean, and about what's left. 10% will not, because it's a 90% confidence interval. If it were a 95% confidence interval, it would say about 95% of these will contain it, and 5% won't. And that's just another way of talking about you know, what the confidence interval means and the confidence level means. So, if I, so let me try to find my thing to stop recording. You guys, go ahead and ask questions if you have while I look to figure out how to stop recording. I don't know what happened here. So talk to me. It's a lot of info. <laughs> I'm still processing. <laughs> <laughs> I completely, completely understand because how do I get in here? Oh, there it goes. It's a lot of information. I know that. And you it's going to take practice. 